everyone. Uh, we are on to the next section in our chapter on uh, discrete random variables. And at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, we got these things called discrete random variables. Uh, all right, what's the point? Why why do we have these things, random variables? What, why, do, why does anyone care about this? This seems like an extra complication on... Uh, this uh, on these probability spaces, we we were still able to talk about probability. We haven't really added really anything so far. Well, random variables truly are an an a, an addition that makes things much better and allows you to say additional things about uh, randomness. Uh, once you have random variables, you are now allowing for. Um, Concepts such as um, uh, you're allowing for concepts such as we have uh, we we have a phenomena that is essentially uh, like phenomena that is essentially the same the same except for a couple parameters. Like there's a few parameters that we need to figure out, and once we know those parameters, we basically know. Uh, everything there is to know about this phenomena or there's concepts such as uh, expectation or mean uh, uh, you in order to be able to talk about expected values you need to have random variables so once we've uh, introduced random variables uh, these things that take in uh, uh, that take uh, 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 things in our sample space and turn it into numbers you now gain a lot of additional structure uh, the first thing that we get that is an essential property of uh, random variables is a probability distribution. So a probability distribution for a random variable is a function that describes the probability that a random variable takes on certain values. Discrete random variables are determined completely by the probability mass function, which is abbreviated PMF. And the probability mass function for a random variable is P of X which is equal to the probability that the, that the random variable X, capital X, so remember that capital X is referring to a random variable. This is a thing that hasn't taken a value at, yet, or we don't view it as being equal to anything per se at this moment, uh, but we're asking for the probability that this random variable, when we actually evaluate it and get a number out of it, is going to equal uh, X. I like to think of random variables as uh, they will have a future value, but they don't really have a value right now when we're asking for their probability and stuff. Uh, so we're asking, what could this thing be in the future? So uh, a coin flip is random before you make the flip, if that makes sense. Um, after you've made the flip, then it's no longer random because you get to see whether it was heads or tails, which actually is... Um, getting more again into the issue of what does probability actually mean. Like, for example, uh, let's suppose that we flip a coin and it lands heads up and then we cover it up. We don't get to look at it. We never saw what the coin did. We immediately, the moment it lands on the ground, uh, cover it up in a box. In principle, uh, we would say that that if, under this uh, frequentist notion of uh, probability we should say that this random variable has a value and is no longer random. We just don't know what it is. Whereas if you're adopting maybe the gambler's notion of, of random of randomness and probability, you might still view it as being random uh, where you can start placing a bet on whether it's heads or tails when you take the lid off of the, uh, when, when, you, when you take the box off of the, off of the coin and then actually observe it. Uh, I'm not going to talk anymore about that. I've already recorded a half-hour video about the interpretation of probabil probability, and you can watch that if you want to learn more. Uh, but, uh, all right, so I I'm just saying this because I feel like students, especially with this notation, this notation, especially when you're starting out, can bother students, and they're wondering what capital X is and what little x is and what's the difference between them. And the difference is this is random and we don't actually know what it is. Whereas little x is something that is fixed and we know what little x is. So um, really when I'm writing this down, little x is going to be substituted for a number. Like for example, there's going to be P of 1. 
which is going to be the probability that capital X is equal to 1. Like, at some point, we're going to make that substitution. Um, so, basically, the little x right here is going to get substituted with a number, but the capital X is never going to get substituted, and that's always going to be viewed right now as being random. And we don't really know what its value is going to be. And we're just studying uh, what its value could possibly end up being and how likely it will end up taking certain values. Uh, sorry if I'm going on too long about this. It's, this is just something that I know that students at some level struggle with. And I try over and over again to try and explain it. And I'm never fully satisfied with my own explanation. Okay. Um, uh, the probability mass function, one way to visualize a probability mass function is using a line graph. Uh, where a line is placed on each point x of r that x takes a positive probability and extends to the height representing p of x. Um, okay, so before I draw a visualization, I'm going to say that we are totally allowed to say, all right, we've got inputs x and outcomes p of x, uh, where p of x is a function that gives us the probability this random variable will equal x. And we can construct a table if we want to, like for example, 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. We could construct a table of uh, possible inputs to this function. And for possible outputs, we could say, uh, let's see, uh, what's uh, something we could do? Uh, we'll just say that all of these are equally likely. So all of these are one-fifth. So this function puts out one-fifth all, all the time. Well, eh, eh, should we always do that? Uh, we might say this is two-fifths. And this is one tenth, and this is one tenth. There, I think that's okay. Does this still add up to one? This must add up to one, by the way. Actually, that's the thing we're going to talk about in the future. Let's see: two one fifth plus one fifth is two fifths, plus two fifths is four fifths, plus two tenths is another fifth. So that does, in fact, add up to one. Which probably mass functions, if you add them up, if you add up all of their non-zero values, then they must always add up to one, always. Probably mass functions always add up to one. If they don't add up to wrong, to one, then they're wrong. They're not probably mass functions. If you ever compute a probably mass function and it doesn't add up to one, then it's not a probably mass function. And I don't care if it's close. It, it close is close is nothing. Close is not one. One is one. All right. Um, okay. And and I suppose we're allowed to say. All right. Let's suppose I threw in. A fifth value then the probably mass function will be zero and presumably anything that's not on this table if I didn't list it out then the probably mass function is zero right so anything not written down is zero all right uh, but then we can visualize a probability mass function using a line graph so we've got possible X values that this thing could take and we've got its probability mass function uh, it's its probability at those points so we could have X equals zero one two, three, four. Uh, and then for those, let's, let's see, I've, I've already got a lot of what I need. So uh, we'll do one tenths, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths. So zero is going to be two tenths. So that's about here. One is going to be two tenths again. And then we got four tenths and then one tenth and one tenth. This is a visualization of the probability mass function that I wrote on the right hand side of the page. So uh, I generally am like drawing a dot at the probability and then drawing a line up uh, to the probability of the random variable equaling that value or something like that. So yeah, uh, that's uh, how you can vi visualize it. There's also probability histograms which are very similar to line to the line graphs and very similar to the histograms that I was discussing uh, several lecture videos ago, where you could, instead of having these uh, lines, uh, draw, I, like these, the, the, the table that I have is a lot like the, the relative frequencies that I was discussing when discussing histograms. So what you would do is draw something similar to the relative frequency of those, uh, of uh, those, um, uh, possible values. So we got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we draw a bar that is uh, centered on that point. So we got, uh, uh, so we've got something going up to 2 tenths and 2 tenths again, 
and then four tenths, and then two one tenths. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, so uh, there's that. Uh, this is another way to visualize the probability distribution if you if you prefer it. Um, there's really no difference. Um, in fact, I would say that Edward Tufte would probably say that they are the same graph, essentially. It's just uh, the one up here it should be preferred because it uses less ink. Okay, uh, continuing on. Uh, let's see some examples. Uh, a fair coin is flipped. We define a random variable x. Uh, when h occurs, x evaluates to 1. And when t occurs, x evaluates to 0. Find the probability mass function of x, which is p of x. Visualize p of x through uh, with a line graph and you're thinking how do we know what the probabilities are well we know because i said this is a fair coin and since i know that it's a fair coin i know that the probability of heads is one and the probability of tails is zero okay so uh i'm going to start out actually with that tabular form so we've got x and p of x so we've got so possible values that x that the random variable x could take are 1 and 0. So we are going to put 0 and 1 as potential values for this random variable. Uh, this random variable will equal 0 if the coin comes tails up. And since this is a fair coin, the probability of getting tails... So actually, maybe I should be more verbose about this and say that the probability that x equals 0 is equal to the probability of drawing an, oma an omega from the sample space, an outcome from the sample space, such that x, when evaluated at that uh, outcome, equals zero. I'm being very verbose about this. Uh, what are such outcomes that causes this to evaluate to zero? Well, we know from the definition of the problem that such outcomes are only tails. So this is the probability that you get tails, and the probability of tails, because this is a fair coin, is one half. So that means that um, x is so at z at zero, the probability mass function will be one half. And at 1, the probability mass function will also be 1 half because, well, A, uh, this random variable, um, well, for, for starters, this random variable is going to be 1 when the coin lands heads up and the probability of heads is 1 half. That's one way to think about it. And another thing to think about it is there's only two numbers that this random variable could take with positive probability, 0 and 1. Uh, 0 uh, its probability mass function is one half. So at one, it must be whatever it takes to cause the probability mass function to add up to one. So one minus one half me is going to be one half, and thus the other value is going to be one half. Uh, so uh, we we visualize this with a line graph. Uh, we'll go ahead and make this one half. Uh, what we end up having for our visualization of the probability mass function is we have lines uh, extending up to. Uh, one half. All right, and that's our visualization for it. Okay, uh, this, by the way, is a complete description of the probability mass function. If we are willing to say that anywhere isn't anywhere we don't list, uh, the probability mass function eva evaluates to zero. Because, like, like it, that should make complete sense to you. Because, let's say, what is going to be p at one half? Well, that is the probability that x equals one half, which equals the probability of drawing an outcome from the sample space that causes the random variable to evaluate to one half. Okay, so we know that there are two outcomes in the sample space, which are heads and tails. And x is a random variable and therefore it is a function. So you know, that functions, uh, when given one input, give you only one output. Only one output will come out. So what does that mean here? Uh, well, we know what this function will be at heads, which is one outcome in the sample space. We know what this function will be at tails, which is the other outcome in the sample space. So what outcome causes this random variable to equal one half? Because neither of those cause the function to evaluate at one half. So that means that the probability of drawing an outcome from the sample space that causes this to evaluate to one half is the probability of the empty set. Because 
the the set of all numbers or not numbers the set of all outcomes in our experiment that causes this random variable to evaluate to one half is the empty set because there is no such outcome so you end up computing the probability of the empty set and the probability of the, of the empty set is zero so that would mean that anything that isn't listed here uh it's natural to say that the probability mass function is zero okay 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 uh moving along moving along there is an r package called discrete rv and this package allows for users to define random variables and work with them and i think this package is pedagogically useful but for serious work with these random variables i wouldn't recommend using it um i uh i've uh i actually just made a few minutes ago uh it wasn't a few minutes ago it was more like a few hours ago i just made a few hours ago uh lecture videos for the lab for r are um, on my r introduction uh, introductory videos um functions for dealing with probability in r and dealing with a lot of random variables and classes of random variables families of random variables and i never use this package uh, because it's more for allowing students a laboratory to work with uh, random variables in the notation that we're using in the lecture class or a notation very similar to it and not actually meant for serious work trying to compute uh, trying to work with the cdfs and the pdfs and expected values and all that stuff of these random variables but it's kind of nice uh, so for example in this situation i could define the random variable x and say that this is a random variable with the rv function its possible values are zero and one and the probability of getting those outcomes are each one half and it will print and make a nice uh, output uh, a printout for that basically summarizing what i just said and in addition to that when i tell r to plot this random variable it creates the plot of the probability mass function so that was all very nice uh, next example let s be the sum of the number of pips rolled on two dice find p of s and plot it okay okay so let's uh come so let's uh form our table again so we've got s and we've got p of s okay so s are possible sums of the dice so what are some possible sums of the dice well, uh, the smallest it could be is two because that's what happens when you roll snake eyes or one and one. So the, poss the, the smallest possible sum is two and the largest one happens when you roll boxcars, which is both of them are six. So that will be 12. So it's going to be everything in between. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Hold on, hold on uh i didn't write that quite right 10 11 12. okay and now we need to figure out uh the probability mass function okay so we're saying we we could imagine that there is a sample space that's consisting of uh dice w w of uh, combinations of two dice like we got one one uh uh, one, two, and two, and going on, and uh, we got like six, six. We've already worked with this uh, type of uh, sample space in previous videos, uh, and I don't want to go into too much more detail into it because it can get kind of tedious. So um, we know that there are 36 outcomes in this uh sample space so and we're saying that everything is equally likely so therefore uh the probability of the event that the dice add up to two is going to be the number of outcomes uh where the two dice add up to two divided by the size of the sample space so how many outcomes are there where the dice add up to two well you can you can get uh snake eyes and that's it uh so there's only one outcome that corresponds to that and then we divide it by 36 uh how about three we could either roll one the left dice and two on the right dice or i guess let's uh 
re-adopt that uh, blue dice, red dice uh, verbiage. And we could say uh, the blue dice rolls a one and the red dice rolls a two. Or we could have the ro- blue dice roll a two and the red dice roll a one. And that's it. Uh, otherwise, it will not be... It will not add up to three. So that's two outcomes that correspond with this. So we're going to have two over 36. And for four, we could either have one and three, two and two, or three and one. So that would be three over 36. And that's going to keep going. So we would have four over 36 for five, uh, five over 36 for six, and six over 36 for seven. Uh, All right, 12. There's only one outcome where you can get 12, and that's boxcars, 6 and 6. So this will be 1 over 36. Uh, For 11, you could get 5 and 6 or 6 and 5. So we'll have 2 over 36. And you can see the pattern. It's going to become 3 over 36 for 10, uh, 4 over 36 for 9, and uh, 5 over 36 for 8. Okay. And now we're ready to create our little visualization. We got 2, 3, 4. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, uh, twelve. Uh, that is an awful looking eleven. I really did try harder, but sometimes the screen doesn't want to cooperate. All right, and uh, let's see. For the y-axis, we could go. Uh, the highest you ever go is six over thirty-six. So we could go one, two, three, four. Five, six. There we go. So six over thirty-six is at the top. So for our probabilities. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and that's it. That's our probability mass function. So, um, using this discrete RV package, uh, we've got what we could do is uh, create a random variable representing a single die. Uh, so that's created here, and then we could say, all right, S is the sum of independent and identically distributed copies of the random variable D. That is getting into verbiage that. Uh, and uh, terms and ideas that I haven't really talked about yet. But basically, you add up two independent dice, which is kind of what's going on in this experiment. And then I tell it to plot it, and it makes a plot, and that's a very good plot. All right. Uh, Next up, consider flipping a fair coin until heads is seen. Let n be the number of flips. Find a probability mass function describing the distribution of n and plot the first few values of the PMF. And... um, We've actually talked about uh, this type of random variable before uh, a number of times in the previous chapter. Uh, As I mentioned there, it's one of my favorite random variables to refer to since on the one hand, it's not like the setup is quite simple to understand. You flip a coin until you get heads. That doesn't that's not that doesn't take a great deal of imagination. And yet you can still get a lot of richness out of it. And the mathematics can get kind of involved so um okay so in this case what we ended up coming up with before and suggest what we should have now in fact maybe if you go back to that video and look at how i was uh showing that the probability of the sample space under some probability measure um will in fact be one i actually kind of defined a prototype random variable n of omega uh that was uh measuring the length of the string and that was, that's basically a random variable right there. Um, I defined a random variable on that space so that I could compute, show that the probability um, uh, of that space added up to one. So, yeah, they're very useful things. But basically, we could just say that this is one half to the power n uh, for when n is a natural number. Uh, otherwise, you would just assume that this thing is going to be zero. So this is a natural probability mass function for this space. We actually showed in that section that it adds up to one. And uh, yeah, so, okay, so uh, let's, um, 
uh, plot this uh, probably mass function. We've got uh, possible values a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty second. So uh, one, two, three, four, five. So for one, we go up to a half. For two, we go up to a fourth. For three, we go up to an eighth. For four, we go up to a sixteenth. And for five, we go up to 32nd. And in principle, this, this graph goes on forever, uh, but we're just gonna stop at five. Okay, uh, it is possible with this discrete RV package to refer to random variables by name. So here I created a geometric random variable. And by default, the, uh, the probability of getting ahead is going to be one half when you create such a random variable. Yeah, there's basically a term for the random variable that we've been working with here, and it's called a geometric random variable. Uh, the term geometric coming because it's probably mass function is a, it is uh, this uh, geometric function that you're adding up a geometric sum. Maybe you remember geometric sums from uh, some of your previous math classes. So we create this random variable and then we plot its probably mass function and it's looking pretty similar to what I just drew myself. Okay, so this is all very nice. And the thing is though, we're now getting, like once we have probably mass functions, uh, we can start adding some more power. We can, to, to our, um, to our uh, methodology, like we can start talking about uh, parameters. We can say that a distribution for a random variable depends on a parameter, which is a value that can be set to different possible values to generate different PMFs for uh, random variables that are similar except for their parameter values. So probability distributions that differ only in the choice of the parameters are called a family of distributions. So examples of such random variables, uh, we've got uh, the Bernoulli random variable that I mentioned in the first section of this chapter. This is a family of random variables or a family of distributions. And the notation that I use is that X follows a Bernoulli distribution with parameter P, where the P, the P parameter comes with an interpretation there is, by the way, no guarantee that a parameter for a probability distribution has a nice interpretation. There are some that don't have nice interpretations. That said, this one does for Bernoulli random variables. P is the probability that X is equal to one. So Bernoulli random variables depend only on one parameter, this parameter P that controls the probability that x is equal to one. Uh, discrete uniform. Uh, so discrete uniform. So u follows a, a discrete uniform. I'm gonna abbre abbreviate it with d-u-n-i-f. That's what I'm, what, I, what I'm going to use to refer to this distribution. And it has two parameters, A and B, that represent the maximal, uh, that re represent the minimum and maximum values of this random variable. Uh, the probability that U is equal to little u is equal to one over B minus A plus one. And the possible values for U are going to be, um, a, A plus one, all going up all the way to B minus one and uh, B. Uh, another random variable, another family of distributions is the geometric. And uh, so N would be a geometric random variable with parameter P. Uh, I don't want to write it that way. Uh, G E O M. Uh, with parameter p and p con is corresponding to the probability that you get ahead or that this thing at, that the sequence ends at any particular time so it's the probability like if you're flipping this coin you're, this coin is allowed to be biased and the probability that this coin lands heads up is going to be p so uh, that's what a geometric would be 
basically the the random variable that we saw up here well i already told you before that is geometric but we could say that this random variable n uh, to use this notation right away n follows a geometric distribution uh, with parameter one half in this situation okay um, so uh, proceeding with some more examples uh, let's suppose that I have a probability mass function and this probability mass function has for its parameter capital N uh, so uh, this probability mass function is equal to 1 divided by N for X in the set uh, 1 2 to N or in other words all integers between 1 and N and I want to show and by the way if you're in my class this is like one of my favorite quiz questions not this in particular but this type of question show that this is a valid probability mass function uh, for uh, well that this that this is in fact a probability mass function so uh, and the way you do that is by showing well first off a probability mass function must be non-negative so it can take zero and it can take numbers above zero but it cannot take numbers less than zero well clearly this thing is going to be non-negative because it's either zero for anything that is not an integer between one and n or it is one over n which is also greater than zero all right that's fine uh the other criterion which is the one that i actually want you to check that i'm actually looking for when grading these types of problems is does it add up to one if you were to sum up over the possible values that this thing can take with positive probability well let's find out um I sum up from x equals 1 to um, capital N, uh, p of x parameterized by m, which is going to be the sum from little x equals 1 to n. This it, function on that set is a constant. It is 1 over n. And since you're adding up a constant n times, this is going to be n over n, which is equal to 1. All right, that's it. We're done for this problem uh, because we have shown that this adds up to 1, and that's all we need to show. Uh, next up, confirm that fnp, which is p times 1 minus p to the power of n minus 1, is a valid probability mass function. This is the probability mass function of the geometric distribution uh, with parameter p. All right, this one's going to be a little bit more involved because we are going to have to uh, work with a geometric sum. All right, so we start adding this thing up, and we're starting from n equals 1 to infinity. Uh, f n p. So that is going to be the sum from n equals 1 to infinity p times 1 minus p to the power n minus 1. And this uh, P is a constant that we have right here. So we could, in fact, have that multiply with the entire sum and say that this is equal to P times the sum from N equals 1 to infinity, 1 minus P to the power N minus 1. And 1 minus P, P is presumed to be a number between 0 and 1. That is... That is something that we really should say when we're specifying a distribution, a, a family of distributions. We should say what restrictions there are, if any, on our parameters. And one restriction we have here is that P be between 0 and 1. Uh, I think that if you have... Well, P, if P is 0, then you have kind of a problem. Uh, if you have uh, P equals uh, 1, then there's less of a problem, but also nothing really interesting. Like P equals 1, you can say this is a random variable that's always 1 because you flip the coin once and it's going to be heads. So this random variable will always be 1. And that what such a random variable, by the way, a random variable that takes, that is with, uh, that where the probability that that random variable equals a particular number, if that probability is 1, we call the random variable degenerate. Uh, because at some level, yeah, it's a random variable, but not really. It's not really random. So uh, anyway, um, uh, continuing on with this, uh, we do have the restriction that P is between 0 and 1. That means that we can use that geometric sum formula that we have. So this will be P 
times. Uh, we know what that sum evaluates to, although uh, there is a little bit of a wrinkle here, though, which is that uh, we have we have n equals one down here and n minus one up here. Uh, there, so that is a slight wrinkle, but maybe you remember though uh, from your previous algebra classes that um, the sum from n equals zero to infinity r to the power n is equal to one over one minus r when the magnitude of r is less than one. Right, so uh, just a little bit different from what I wrote down in that previous video because we're starting our sum from zero rather than one. Uh, anyway, so what that means here is what we could do is say instead that n minus one, uh, n minus one equals zero. That's equivalent to saying that n is equal to one. And then after we say that, replace n minus one everywhere with j. So we'll say that we're summing up with um, from j equals zero to infinity by replacing n minus one with j. All right, and that is perfectly allowed. So this is kind of if you're, all right, let's say that you have just taken your calculus classes and you've been seeing stuff like change of variables and integrals and stuff like that. This is basically a change of variables. All right, um, it's like, it's a change of variables. It's, it's a, uh, very similar to that, although ultimately simpler because it's not calculus. Anyway, um, we've got, then we can, uh, now we're able to, to apply that formula that we had before and say that this is P times uh, one over one minus P. Oh, wait, one minus one. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, let me write that a little bit differently. It's one minus parentheses, one minus P. Uh, one minus parentheses, one minus P, close parentheses. All right, which is going to be P over P, which equals one. All right, and that's what we need to show. It is a valid probability mass function. All right, uh, the next important concept that not you're probably thinking that probably mass functions are really important and this concept is arguably just as important and maybe more so this is the cumulative distribution function which is abbreviated cdf this is the definition of the cdf always and forever everywhere all the time this is what a cumulative distribution function is this is its definition Discrete random variables, continuous random variables, uh, Cauchy set valued random variables, if you really want to get foreign, uh, f of x, where we have little x in this inside, is equal to the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to little x. If it really bugs you, if it just bugs you so much to have capital X and little x, like, I am willing to make a distinction in this one case and not write down little x. I mean, I like to keep the uppercase and lowercase letters together so that I can keep clear what exactly I'm talking about and what is associated with what. Because sometimes you might have a random variable x and a random variable y. And if you're using uppercase uh, x and y and lowercase little x and little y, you know what little x and little y are kind of referring to. But if you really wanted to, I think it's so important for you to understand what a CDF is that I am willing to replace little x with a this one time if this will make it easier for you to understand that this is a number that you plug in. Um, I, like, I don't really care about what you call the letter. Um, I really, I, I do not care what you call the letter. What really matters is that this is measuring the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to some upper bound, and that upper bound is what you put into the function. Okay? So, um, uh, like for example, uh, just to keep playing around with this, f evaluated at uh, 1 is equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. All right? So it's a function 
that where you put in numbers and it will tell you that the probability and it will tell you the probability that your random variable is less or equal to that input. All right. Okay. I've said the same thing like two or three or four times in effect and every single time I, and I, and I don't, and I don't regret saying it multiple times over and over again because C CDFs are something that students seem to get really confused about and yet they are so important. So there is, this is something that I really want you to walk away from today understanding. Um, or if you don't understand today, I hope you understand it soon because PDF, uh, CDFs are really important. So uh, for starters, let's suppose that we had the CDF. It is in fact possible to recover the PDF from the CDF. Uh, you can get what the value of the CDF is uh, no, 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 sorry. You can get the value of what the PDF is from the CDF. The probability mass function of the random variable at some value x is equal to the CDF at that value x minus uh, the CDF at the uh, left-hand limit of that point. Okay. Uh, let's explain that in just a second. Uh, this formula will make a little bit more sense after I draw a plot. So I'm going to draw that plot, but in just a second. Uh, in general, a function f is a CDF if it satisfies the following three properties. The first property that a function must satisfy to be a valid CDF is this you must have the limit as x approaches um, negative infinity of the CDF that limit as it approaches negative infinity must be equal to zero so CDFs get smaller as you decrease your input x and they get so small that they go to zero if you could plug in a negative plug in negative infinity and similarly, the limit as x approaches infinity of the CDF is equal to 1. So if you increase your uh, x, the CDF will... Well, actually, I should probably write this down um, uh, because this is actually a fundamental property. Uh, f of x is non-decreasing. So it's a non-decreasing function. At no point is the CDF allowed to decrease. It is allowed to stay constant. It's allowed to stay flat. But it can't actually decrease. Um, but as you increase your input x, this CDF may end up increasing to the point that it either reaches 1, either at a number, or maybe in the limit. So if you could plug in infinity, it would be 1. So... Uh, you can actually learn something from just these two properties so far. Like, for example, I said that the CDF of a random variable uh, is non-decreasing. It can be flat. That said, since its limit as you make x small, since, it's, since that limit is 0 and the other limit as you make x large is 1, you know that at some point this function will increase. Somewhere it will. You, it, it, that's pretty much guaranteed because of the disagreeing limits at infinities. Uh, and also the fact by 2 that f is non-decreasing. So, uh, the third property, this one is more exotic. Uh, I think that this is one that uh, 3070 students are not necessarily going to fully appreciate. And it also could arguably be one that they probably don't need to pay as much attention to. Uh, CDFs are right continuous. So what that means is that uh, the limit of the CDF as it approaches a number x from the positive end or from the right-hand side is going to equal the value of the CDF at that point. 
So we can actually illustrate with a little uh, cartoon uh, what a CDF would look like for discrete random variables. Dis uh, continuous random variables are going to look a little bit, their CDFs look different. Uh, but for discrete random variables, we could have something like this. We've got one up here, zero down here. Uh, let's see. So we've got some inputs, like for some possible values for this random variable. We've got x1, x2, x3. These represent uh, values that this random variable could possibly take with positive probability. So let's just suppose for a second that um, x1 down here is the minimum number that this random variable is going to take. That is actually not required, by the way. It's possible that there isn't a minimum. You could, you could if you really wanted to. I don't know how. I don't know how you would do this, but you could define a int an integer valued random variable where all integers between negative infinity and infinity could uh, uh, could be picked with positive probability. I'm not really sure how you do that, but it is possible to do. All right. Um, so uh, this random variable, uh, its smallest value is, is x1, and anything below x1, uh, the CDF will be zero. And what that basically means is if I ask what's the probability that this random variable is less or equal to this number that I've uh, picked in green, that's going to be zero, which also means that the probability that it equals this number is going to be zero and anything less than that's going to be zero. Okay. Uh, right. So continuing on. So I draw an open circle here to indicate that actually X1 is not included in this point. And the reason why I'm not including it is because this function uh, because this cdf is right continuous so i put in a filled in circle to indicate that the point up here is actually um the value of the function at x1 so we've got x1 right here uh, and the the size of the jump is p of x1 so the size of the jump is the value of the probability mass function at the point x1 all right, we continue on drawing a straight line because it's a discrete random variable. And for discrete random variables, it's going to be a flat line since discrete random variables cannot take values in between x1 and x2. The probability mass function at those points is going to be zero. So it's going to be completely flat along this region. And then you put an open circle around x2. And since this is non-decreasing, I must go up. So I must go up if I'm going to jump at all. And the amount by which I jump is going to be the value of the probability mass function at x2. All OK, and then I continue along. I'm flat until I reach x3, in which I'm going to jump again. And the amount by which I jump is going to be the probability mass function at x3. And then it's going to be flat, and it's possible that the probably that the CDF does in fact hit one. It could hit one. I didn't draw that here though, because it's also possible that it doesn't ever hit one. It just approaches one asymptotically as your input x to your uh, uh, CDF increases. All right, so I promised you that I would explain this formula up here a little bit more. Uh, I'll, I'll even go ahead and say, I'll define what exactly I mean by f of x minus. f of x minus is the left-hand limit of the function uh, of, of the CDF at the point x. So it's the left-hand limit, so it's the limit of the CDF as you approach the input x from the left hand side so what this formula is saying and what actually i think the picture makes more apparent uh, in fact you know what? i'm just going to say this uh f of x minus uh another way to read this part is to say that this is the next largest number so next largest number less than x. Okay. 
Um, that's one way to read it. That's basically what it's trying to say. That's what. That's how you would translate. Um, that's how you would translate this limit down here. That's its uh, translation. Uh, but let's uh, look a little bit more at this formula. But in the context of this graph, uh, what you're, what I'm basically saying is, you have these jumps in the CDF, and the CDF jumps by the value of the probability mass function at that point. So if you wanted to recover the value of the probability mass function, what you do is you uh, take the value of the CDF at that point and then subtract its value at uh, the next largest point at the at, at prior to the jump, right? You subtract its value prior to the jump from its value at the jump, immediately prior to the jump. If you wanted to, since most of these random variables, there is actually a simplification since conveniently most discrete random variables are integer valued. You could say uh, for uh, integer valued, uh, so integer valued random variables that, uh, that a P of X is equal to F of X minus f at uh, x minus 1. You, 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 can, uh, you can do that instead. This notation that I have over here on the, on the right-hand side, though, is the more general and true version. Uh, but that other formula will be right most of the time, and it will be right in this class pretty much every time. Since I've, I can't... I can't think of a time that I've had an inter, a, a non-integer valued um, random variable. On the other hand, I bet that there is. So just pay attention and see if the random variable is in fact integer valued and you should be okay. All right. Uh, so like a PMF, a CDF uh, completely characterizes a, a random variable. I, You know what? I've been beating around the bush about this for way too long. I'm going to write down what the P, what the CDF is in terms of the probability mass function. This will probably clarify a lot for you. This will be the sum uh, over T such that T is less than or equal to X. P of T. Presumably uh, P of T at these points is greater than zero. So what I'm saying is add up the probability mass function at its points less than or equal to x where it's positive. And that will be the CDF at that point. That's how you compute a CDF with discrete random variables. Okay, uh, continuing a little on a little bit. Like a probability mass function, a CDF completely characterizes a random variable. Once we know a CDF, we know everything there is to know about that random variable in a sense. Uh, we can use it for computing probabilities of regions using the following rules. Um, like you're probably thinking, why on earth do these do people care so much about this thing? Well, there's the uh, graduate probability answer for why we care, but there's also this answer. We could say that the probability that a is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to b. So we have some interval. This, by the way, is the formula for discrete random variables. This is equal to f. Evaluate at B minus F at A minus, put it using that minus notation again, meaning the next largest integer, or let not, not next or largest integer, let, good God, uh, not, oh my gosh, I need to stop. Um, I can't talk today. I, how long have I been lecturing? Anyway, <laughs> I've recorded like five or six videos today. Okay, um, next largest number. Finally, I was able to say it. Or most of the time, you could probably just get away with a minus 1 when you're talking about uh, integer-valued random variables. But f of a minus is the more technically appropriate and also translates better when we go to continuous random variables. Um, whereas the a minus 1 down here would not translate to continuous random variables. But anyway, this CDF gives you a way to compute the probability of regions. 
of regions bounded between A and B. And guess what? That's often what we want to compute the probability for. We're computing that so much that we have a function that can do it very easily. Um, it, alternatively, if you were to use the probability mass function, what you'll be forced to do is add up the probability mass function from x equals a to b, uh, p of x. You would have to do that. Uh, but you have a CDF now, uh, and the CDF kind of tabulates that for you already. So another formula that's very similar is the probability that a is less than x, which is less than or equal to b. That probability is going to be f of b minus f of a. Okay, so notice that in this first case, we want to include a in the event. We want to include a in the region. We want to allow x to possibly equal a. Hence, we end up with this more complicated looking formula, this weirder looking formula, because we need to include a. But if we subtract out f at a, we will actually remove a from the region. Here, since we are removing a from the region, we can subtract out a. We can subtract out the value of the probability mass function at a. So it's fine to just do f of b minus f of a. Okay, uh, next example. Compute and plot the CDF for a random variable x, which is following a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. Okay, so when computing CDFs, what I'm generally doing, uh, not that. What I'm generally doing is I'm computing these piecewise functions that are uh, constant on most regions. So let's see. There's going to be a series of breaks. So I'm going to consider the value of the CDF when x is between negative infinity and 0, when 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 1. And x and when x is greater than or equal to one, these are the three scenarios I'm going to pick. Now you're probably wondering, what's so great about zero, and what's so great about one? Why did I pick those numbers? The reason why is because those are the numbers for which the probability mass function is non-zero. So I'm going to pick the numbers at which the probability mass function is non-zero to be the boundaries at which I'm computing the uh, CDF. Okay, so uh, when x is between negative infinity and zero, I all right. So I can pretty much guarantee you that this that the CDF is going to be constant on this region. So if I wanted to, what I could do is pick a point that's less than zero and compute the probability that x is less than or equal to that point. So the probability that x is less than or equal to negative one. All right. So this is a Bernoulli random variable. Bernoulli random variables are going to be 0 and 1 with positive probability, and for everything else, they're 0. So when will the Bernoulli random variable ever be less than negative 1? Never. And it never will equal negative 1, so that means that the CDF at this point is going to be 0. And the CDF on this region is going to be 0. Uh, let's go ahead and start preparing our plot of the CDF. So here's, here's 1, here's 0. Okay. Uh, here's zero, and here's another one. Okay, so that means that the CDF is going to be zero all along this region. Okay, now between zero inclusively and one exclusively, let's compute the probability that X is less than or equal to now um, one half. All right, what's the probability that X is less than or equal to one half? Well, there's only one thing that x could possibly be with positive probability, and that's zero. So this is the probability that x is equal to zero, since that's the only thing that actually falls into this event, and that's going to be uh, one minus p. So this will be one minus p. And all right, so that means that here we've got, I'll just write one minus p. So we'll draw um, a solid, a filled in dot because we're including that point in this interval here. And then we have an open circle at one. Uh, but this, by the way, um, here's one half. Okay, 
but we know that the CDF is going to be flat on this region, so we could pick any number uh, between 0 and 1, excluding the ends, or even including the end 0, and this logic would hold. Um, uh, yeah, but that will not always be true, especially in the case of continuous random variables. And then finally, let's consider the case uh, that um, where we're trying to compute the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. Let's try 2. Okay, uh, 2. All right, the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. Well, if that's the case, uh, when is x less than or equal to 2? Well, it's less than or equal to 2 and it's 0, and it's less than or equal to 2 and it's 1. So this is going to be the probability that uh, x equals 0 or x equals 1. But here's the thing, though. x is going to be either 0 or 1 with probability 1. So that means that this is that this is going to be one, right? Because those are the only two things that x could possibly be with positive probability. So it adds up. So it ends up being one. So we get one here. We'll put a solid dot for one, and then the line just continues on. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, next. Oh, and uh, for what it's worth, uh, here's a, uh, I forgot about this. Here's some R code that will be doing this. Um, P binom is a function that is actually meant for binomial random variables, not Bernoulli. Although the thing though is Bernoulli is a special case of binomial. Uh, Bernoulli is binomial when the size parameter is equal to one. So we can use P binom for Bernoulli random variables. And this is the reason why there isn't a function in R devoted to Bernoulli random variables. It's because it's already taken for, taken care of. Um, so I plotted using, um, I created a step function to represent the CDF and, uh, uh, and, uh, just, uh, plotted it. And this is the resulting plot. All right. Uh, next example, consider rolling a four sided dice that produces numbers from one to four. And we're going to assume that this is a fair dice. So X is following a discrete uniform distribution uh, with um, minimum parameter 1 and maximum parameter 4. Let's compute the CDF of x and plot it. Okay. So uh, we've got our CDF. And I know that the probability mass function of this random variable is going to be 1 fourth at 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. So that means that the boundaries... Uh, what, this is still going to be a piecewise function, so... Uh, for the pieces, I've got negative infinity is less than x, which is less than 1. 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 2. 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 3. 3 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 4. And x is greater than or equal to 4. Okay. Uh, these are the possible values for... Um, Oh, okay. The reason why it shows those boundaries is because those are uh, the values at which the probability mass function is non is a uh, is a uh, non-zero where it, when it's positive. And additionally, um, you can think of it as those are the values that this random variable could take with positive probability. So those that motivates those choices of boundaries. Uh, so uh, for the case when x is between negative infinity and one. So this is this will be the probability that x is less than or equal to uh, one of the points that we could choose for this is zero actually. So could this random variable be zero or less? The answer is no because the minimum value of this thing will take a positive probability is one. So that means the CDF on this region will be zero. Okay, uh, if we were to plot this, I've got one, two, three, four as my borders and I've got this thing running from 0 to 1 and uh, this function is going to be 0 up until 1 and then uh, let's see this is going to be all right so I basically gave away the problem uh, all right let's uh, try in the case when x is between 1 and 2 if I wanted to I'm going to compute the probability that x is less than or equal to uh, uh, three halves. All right, because that's between one and two. Uh, what does this equal? This is the probability that x is equal to one. 
because that's the only thing in this region that x is equal to with positive probability, or, or that x could possibly be with positive probability. Um, so the probability that x is equal to one is equal to one is going to be one fourth. So this will be one fourth. So we're going to jump up in our CDF graph by one fourth. Uh, next scenario, two is less than or equal to x, which is less than three. All right, let's uh, erase some stuff. All right, uh, let's try for this one, uh, 2.5. For goodness sakes. Oh, for goodness sakes. Two point, good grief. Just draw the dot for goodness sakes. 2.5, thank you. Ugh. All right, so in this situation, uh, X is going to be, this is the same as the probability that X is either uh, one or two, because those are the two numbers in this region that X could possibly be with positive probability. So what is the probability that X is equal to one? That's gonna be one fourth. What's the probability that X is equal to two? That's gonna be one fourth. So this is equal to uh, the probability mass function at one plus the probability mass function at two, Hold on. Ah, sorry, I had to sneeze. All right, uh, so that's going to be uh, one fourth plus one fourth, which is equal to one half. All right, so this will be one half, uh, which means that our function is going to jump up from one fourth to one half at two and stay at one half until three. Okay, uh, next up for, oh, I don't wanna erase stuff. Uh, so let's try, um, so now we have, now we're checking the case when we're inputting a number between three and four. So we could try, uh, for example, 3.5 as our input, because that's in that interval. All right, so uh, this is going to be, like you can probably see the pattern by now. This is the probability that X is going to be either uh, one, two, or three, since those are the only possibilities it could take with positive probability, which is equal to P of one plus P of two plus P of three, which is equal to one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth, which is equal to three fourths. So this is equal to three fourths. So that means that our CDF graph is gonna jump up from one half to three fourths up until it reaches four. And for X greater than or equal to four, I'm gonna try just for fun. Uh, let's try X is less than or equal to five. So we're erasing all of this stuff. Okay, so, oh, I uh, need to do some more erasing. Uh, all right, so we got uh, X less than equal to five. That means that X, yeah, there's a dead, there, I found another dead spot on my screen. Okay, so this is going to be the probability that X is either one, two, three, or four. But we know that X will be one of those numbers with probability one, so this is going to equal one. So this will be one. In the end, this will be one. And that is just gonna go on forever. This down here also goes on forever. All right, here's a plot of this. This time I'm using uh, RV. Uh, I uh, created a function in R to represent the CDF. Um, I'm allowed to do that when I'm using discrete RV. Uh, I vectorize this function and then I plot it and this is the resulting plot. Looks quite nice. Uh, next example. Uh, fine. All right, hold on. How, how much longer? <laughs> Okay, we're almost done. This is the last example. Uh, I'm getting tired. I'm, I don't know how long this video has been running. 
I, I don't have any like timer on my screen telling me how long it's been. So uh, last example, find the CDF of a geometric random variable with parameter P. What would a plot of the CDF look like? So this is a trickier situation since I'm clearly not going to, I'm clearly not going to go consider every single case between one, two, three, four, five to infinity because I can't because eventually we need to end this video. So uh, instead I'm going to have to adopt some more notation in order to make this work. Um, so the notation that I'm going to use is this uh, round down notation or floor function notation. So uh, here's what we're going to do. We know what we would do if we plugged in an x uh, less than one. All right, so let's let's start out with um, x less than one. So for x less than one, uh, the p the uh, CDF is just going to equal zero. All right, that was simple enough. Because uh, that's because uh, geometric random variables are going to be at least one. They cannot go less than one. Uh, although I will probably caveat that with saying that there are some versions of the CDF uh, of the geometric random variable that are described a little bit differently. I've described geometric random variables as counting the length of a string, whereas in some situations, some authors might call a geometric random variable a random variable that counts the number of failures before success or the number of tails before heads. In which case, it could possibly be zero because you could get heads on the first flip, flip, in which case there were no tails. So there is that difference in parameterization that would actually matter later on in a later section when we talk about negative binomial random variables. Since those random variables are a lot like the geometric random variable, but they are parameterized uh, in terms of number of failures before so many successes. Uh, but uh, before going on any more on that, uh, we know what it is when x is less than 1. It's, the CDF is going to be 0 since this thing is at least 1. Now let's consider for x greater than or equal to, to 1. Well, if we were to um, work with uh, uh, f of x, let's imagine for a second that x is an integer. So we'll just imagine for a second that this is, in fact, a whole number, an integer. Uh, in that case... What we would do is we would add up the probability mass function uh, for all values between um, 1 and x. Because remember what this is, uh, what this will be calculating is the probability that 1 is less than or equal to uh, x, which is less than or equal to uh, little x. So what that suggests we should do is add up the probability mass function uh, between uh, x equals, uh, no, not x, um, n equals 1. Uh, n equals 1 to x, if it were in fact integer valued. And by the way, just in case anyone is wondering, I could also do this. I could remove the one minus uh, one is less than or equal to x part, and it would be exactly the same. I'm just able to put one less, is less than or equal to x there because I've said that x that this uh, lowercase x um, right here is uh, at least one. Okay. Here's the thing, though. Uh, we're pretty good. That is technically true. Uh, the unfortunate thing is we want this to work for not just integer valued but x but also non-integer valued x as well it should the cdf should be defined for all real values so what we're going to do is throw on a floor function uh, i'm going to uh, do a little bit of erasing clean clean things up a little bit and write instead the floor of x or another term for this is the integer part of x let me explain this notation some more um, this is the floor function. You can read it as integer part. Or more simply, how I always 
uh, refer to it round down. Oops, not round dowd, round down. Because what you're going to do is you're round, is you're going to round down. For example, the floor function at one is equal to one because there's no rounding that's necessary. The floor function at one point four is equal to one because you round down to one. The floor function at one point nine nine is equal to one because you round down. The floor function at two is equal to two because that's a whole number. Okay. So that's what that means. Uh, and that will take care of the situation uh, of the uh, non integer situations since uh, this random variable is going to take only integer values. So that means that the probability that's going to be a non integer value is going to be zero. So you'll only need to worry about the integer parts. Okay. Uh, so then we can start doing some algebra and say, I probably at this point want to speed through a little bit on the algebra. Say that this is equal to p, factoring out that constant, times the sum from n equals 0 to uh, x minus 1. This is basically a change of variables of uh, 1 minus p to the power n. And there is, in fact, a formula for that. And at this point, I am so tired of mentioning formulas that you should have seen in your uh, intermediate algebra classes that I'm going to go ask that you look it up. Uh, the Wikipedia page, I am sure, is awesome. So in the end, this is going to end up being uh, one p times one minus one minus p uh, to the power of. Uh, uh, hold on, um, I'm I'm, I'm going to run out of room for this, so I'm going to move this. Uh, all right, so picking up where I was before I decided that I'm going to move that somewhere else so I have more room. So I got p times 1 minus 1 minus p uh, to the power of integer part of x minus 1 plus 1 divided by 1 minus 1 minus p. Okay, so the minus 1 plus 1 cancels out. The 1 minus 1 plus p cancels out with the p. And in the end, what you're left with is that this is equal to one minus one minus p to the uh, to the power of the integer part of x, and that's it. So what does this uh, look like as a graph? Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just draw it here. Um, when I zoom out, this is going to be really small, but that's okay. We got one, two, three. Four, and then uh, empty circle going to the left of one. Uh, up here we've got one dot 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 dot. Okay, and uh, this function will jump up to. Uh, let's let's pretend that the parameter is one half. Uh, so we'll got so it'll jump up to here. Empty circle jump up to here. Empty circle uh, on the on the right hand side jump up to here and uh, continue on and it's going to keep going on like that it's never actually going to hit one uh but it's going to get very close to one because the limit of uh this part as you take x out to infinity is going to be zero so its limit is going to be one as x approaches positive infinity uh we know that its limit as it approaches negative infinity is zero because it actually does hit zero and never uh increases from there and uh and so on Okay, so that is an appropriate picture. Uh, let's uh, zoom out some more. Okay, uh, continuing on, here is some R code that can generate what this CDF function looks like. Uh, pretty similar to what I've already been describing up to this point. Uh, so that's it for this section. It was a, it was a long one, but it was also very important. Um, so yeah, that's uh, working with a... CDF, uh, that's uh, working with essential characteristics of uh, random variables. Uh, all discrete random variables have probability mass functions. Every random variable everywhere, no matter what it is, has a CDF. So hopefully we'll get more experience with these things as we go through other lecture notes, but practice these ideas a lot, especially the CDF. 
the CDF seems to be something that students really tend to get confused with. So uh, I'm going to end the lecture here and uh, have a good day.